And so, as I said, this is between 10 and 14,000 years ago. What changed? What caused this? There's a couple of things that come into play. Your book talks about some of this. Some of it was environmental change, right? Um, some of it was the die off of some of the large megafauna. We weren't able to make a living hunting, um, you know, mastodons and those kinds of things anymore. And so we needed a food source. We were also increasing our, our population. And so it really wasn't viable for us to be in these 20, 30, 40 groups of people just moving around. And so, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. As the environment changed, our population is growing. We needed something new and humans are very inventive. We're very adaptive. It's why we're the dominant species. And so, um, you know, we moved into this revolution uh, of domestication, you know. What does this give us though? Your book talks about this stuff. Again, it's super important. We have more time, right? We already had increasing populations, but now our populations can increase even more because kids aren't going to go hungry because mom is not going to go hungry. She can produce breast milk. Um, we've got way more time, not obviously increase, increase leisure time, right? We don't have to hunt and gather all day long every day. We can now uh, say like, okay, you know, 10% of our society or 20% of our society, 30% of our society doesn't have to farm. They don't have to get food. Now you can look at um, becoming a specialized tool worker, craft worker, uh, dedicated religious practitioner, right? There's no dedicated, there's no priests in the, in the, uh, in hunter gatherer societies, right? Um, now you can have a man or a woman whose sole job it is to deal with the supernatural, to deal with God or the spirits or whatever, right? Um, um, we have a, a decrease in land in the sense that there's available land, right? Because um, I now need to fence this off and say, these are my crops. You don't get to just walk you through here. Those are mine, right? That may have led to an increase in warfare, right? We don't really see a lot. We do see some conflict in the ancient uh, prehistory uh, uh, of humans in the Neolithic, or excuse me, in the Paleolithic. We do see some conflict, certainly. But we see a big increase of it once we get into the Neolithic Revolution, probably because it becomes much more critical. Um, if you're hunting in this area and I was kind of hunting here first, I might be pissed off, but I can just move to another area and hunt. But if I spent the better part of a year clearing this land and tilling this land and irrigating this land and planting this land and you want to come in and eat my crops, that's going to be a problem. I can't just go over there and start over. I'm going to starve if I don't protect these, right? Um, as I mentioned in, a, in the Paleolithic, we had no formal leaders. Now we have formal leaders, right? We have people that are in charge to say, this is where we're going to live. This is where we're going to plant. We're going to work together. And this is how much grain each of us gets as an allotment. Um, this person, you know, we need to settle a dispute. Whose pig is this? Whose cow is that? Um, you know, who isn't pulling their weight in the village to help maintain the irrigation trenches, to uh, maintain the fences, to keep critters out of the out of the corn or out of the potatoes or those kinds of things we need somebody to arbitrate when we have those conflicts as we have more and more and more people and we're living uh more densely right so we're going to have more social complexity we're going to have religious leadership political leadership right interestingly enough we have decreased nutrition humans got way less healthy um foragers make the most extensive use of the environment meaning that they eat more things than other people Agriculturalists and horticulturalists make the most intensive use. I'm not eating a lot of stuff, but I'm really going to intensify my effort on this one particular thing, right? Uh, and of course, a massive increase in material culture. Because if you're sedentary, it makes more sense. If we're moving every, like I said, week to month, and we don't have pack animals, I got to carry everything. So I don't want a lot of shit. I don't want to have to carry things all the damn time, right? And so I'm going to really limit how much stuff I have. And so, um, you know, I got to be able to hold it or put it in a, a backpack or a bag or a net, you know, thing. Um, that's it. That's all I can own. Well, now I'm going to live here forever. This is my house and I can have art and I can have pottery. Art isn't, like I said, another thing that is, seems uniquely human. I can have figurines. I can have um, multiple tools. I can have things that maybe I don't need a lot of. But gee, you know, this seems to help. What the hell? I'll, I'll keep it around. I'll throw it in the corner, right? You know, those kinds of things, you know. So huge increase in material culture, okay? Um, and this is really the rise of the state. And when I say the state, I mean state-level political organization. This is the rise of 
um, government and the ability to exert coercive power on people, the ability to tell people what to do. In forager societies, you're autonomous. No one can tell you what to do. You are completely independent of other individuals, right? Once you get into state level political organization, once you have settled villages and you have crops and you have cows and you have sheep and you have increasing population numbers, right? Um, having a stable food source, it affects uh, human fecundity and it, it, it means that we uh, become both more fertile and we're more likely to carry uh, a pregnancy to term if we have you know, stable food. Uh, so increased population, more internal conflict, right? We need people to say that there are rules. We need people to settle disputes. And so we're gonna have a chief or a king, or a chancellor, or a president, or whatever you want to call them down the road, right? But ultimately, the, 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 the end game of this is going to be states um, and people having coercive power. They get to tell you what to do, that say you cannot take that. It is your neighbors. That's called theft. And um, today we have a prison system. In the ancient world, it was usually um, the loss of access to resources. They would say, okay, well, you stole this, so now we're going to take away stuff from you. We're not going to allow you to use that field that we've all built to grow our crops, so you're going to go hungry and things like that. Um, they're going to deny you uh, access to resources and rights and those kinds of things because that's what the state does. The state grants you rights, but they can take them away. We often in the United States talk about inalienable rights. There's actually no such thing. Um, every right you think you have, the state can take away. The right to free speech, yeah, actually they've told you already you can't say anything, right? You can't run into a theater and yell fire. Uh, you have the right to own a gun in America, unless you're convicted of a felony, and then we take that right away. As I've said before, I think, and other lectures too, we have the ultimate expression of state power, which is to kill you. It's the only group that's allowed to kill you. Uh, if you do something heinous enough, um, whether it be murder or treason or whatever, the state can say, that thing, we hate it so much, we're gonna kill you for doing it, right? They can literally take away your right to life, right? So you have no right that the state cannot take away. We think of ourselves as being so free foragers are free right if foragers no one can tell them what to do right uh, but ultimately that this is who we are right and as i said at the beginning um this is about the rise of civilizations you know but what is a civilization right um it, it, it's a very problematic statement and so cities right civilizations of cities okay well how big does a city have to be right um what makes a city in the ancient world okay how, how complex does the architecture need to be? What if, as happened with some groups, they actually live in small bands separate from each other for most of the year, but part of the year they come together. Uh, some of the Plains Indians did this during buffalo hunts. They would actually come together and they would have a city of 10,000 people. That's certainly a city in the ancient world. They'd have, you know, massive, huge, huge, huge. But then when they break up, are they not civil? Do they not have a civilization anymore? We're very uncomfortable with the term civilization. Right, because it, having a civilization means you're civilized. And if you don't have a civilization, it means you're uncivilized. And that's the kind of terminology that we use to justify um, in our history, particularly from Europeans. That's the kind of language calling people uncivilized. That justifies us enslaving you, stealing all of your land, killing men, raping women, um, exploiting your labor, exploiting your history, you know, these kinds of things. So civilization is a very problematic term for us in anthropology, right? Um, craft specialization is another thing that we talk about with civilization. But again, we do see some craft specialization well before we get into um, um, domestication. Again, we see art from 40,000 years ago, right? Um, social stratification and political hierarchy is definitely something that we see most there. Um, but so, you know, what, what is civilization? What is this term? It is too often such an, a flexible term as to have no significant, excuse me, significant meaning for us within anthropology. And again, it has this very problematic history of, you know, the civilized people with a civilization can go to the uncivilized people that don't have cities and writing and all of this and um, brutalize them and destroy them and cause genocides and these kinds of things. I have a question mark behind writing because when Europe, Europeans landed in the, uh, the New World, the largest civilization, the largest group, right, state power on earth was the Incan Empire, right, uh, that spread all up and down the Andean Cordillera in South America. 
It's the largest group of people under one state leadership, yet they didn't have writing. They never invented a writing system, right? They had record keeping by tying knots on strings, but they never had writing. So you're telling me that the largest cultural group with the biggest cities, the highest population that has an emperor and a complex religious history and spans across what is today Ecuador, Peru, Colombia, Chile, uh, I think into Argentina even, uh, you know, and, and, and further, it's literally up and down damn near the entire continent. But you're telling me that's not a civilization? Well, then what the hell does that word even mean? Okay, and so if it can't apply to that, I question how much it could apply to anything. And so we don't usually talk about civilization uh, because, as I said, it's just too flexible of a term. Okay, all right, well, thank you guys very much. Uh, I will see you next time.